Hello and welcome to Dialogue. On Thursday, China successfully la launched its core module for the Tiangong Space Station from Wenchang Spaceport. The launch marks the beginning of an intense construction phase for the three-module space station. So what are the plans for the Chinese space station and what will it help Chinese and international scientists to accomplish? To find out more, I'm joined in the studio by Xu Yanzong, Director General of the Asia-Pacific Space Cooperation Organization, and by Skype by Dr. Tracia LaRose, Principal Investigator of the Cancer Research Group Tumors in Space, and later on by Professor Bernard Foeing, Director of the International Lunar Exploration Workgroup's Euro Moon Mars Project, and Chair of International Astronautical Federation's Committee for the Utilization of Space. That is our topic, I'm Wang Guan. Mr. Xu, welcome to Dialogue. Um, first of all, can you tell us the significance of this Chinese mission? Well, if you're talking about building a house, this will be the cornerstone. So we launched the main body or the core segment of, uh, uh, of the station, the Tianhe, uh, which comprises uh, basically all the uh, element for driving the station. Uh, we have the control center as well as the inhabitant areas as well as the uh, uh, racks for uh, scientific experiments. On board the, uh, the Tianhe, we have a number of instruments that are ready to control the station from uh, ground up. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, we're putting this infrastructure into the right uh, altitude and inclination, which is four, 400 kilometers above the Earth and 40 to 41 uh, degree inclination that is circling the Earth right now. So we're ready for the next step, which is to send more cargoes uh, into the station. And this is also very crucial because uh, previous missions we have uh, done the microgravity environment fueling uh, process because as you know that the fueling in ground, you have all the liquid on the on the floor or the bottom of the, uh, of the container. In microgravity environments, everything is floating. So fueling is challenging as well. So we've done that experiment. So we're, re we're ready to, for the next cargo mission to fuel the, the Tianhe so that we can sustain the orbit. Um, you know, to our average viewers who are uh, not necessarily um, you know, familiar with the situation, with what the Chinese mission is all about, um, can you explain to us what are really driving uh, the Chinese you know, and their passion to send this, uh, you know, to set up this space station? Well, I think um, uh, uh, as, a, as, as a Chinese or maybe international space community, you have witnessed a number of uh, uh, very brief and ambitious uh, programs already implemented uh, from China. Uh, we have launched the tm one Mars mission, and also we, we grab the, a piece of moon and bring back the sample by the Chang'e 5. Some 1.7 kilograms of uh, lunar samples has been brought back to Earth. Uh, that has not happened 40 years uh, since the last Russia mission. So uh, the Tianwen one came just naturally uh, after we had a substantial economic, economic development. And so that also enabled us to have more ambitious space programs. This is also a, a, the third step of the three-step uh, manned mission program which is to land the moon, and, uh, land the uh, person into space, uh, launch the, 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 and also conducting EVA and rendezvous and docking technologies. Uh, that is also done by Tiangong 1 and Tiangong 2. And this is the finale uh, to build the uh, Chinese space station uh, starting from today. That sounds very exciting, uh, although I'm still trying to digest what you're, you're t telling me here. Uh, Dr. LaRose, let me go to you. Uh, you have been very dedicated uh, to medical research in space. Your organization, uh, Tuners in Space, has been doing just that. Uh, how do you look at the significance, the importance of this mission? Well, first, let me say today, uh, from Norway to China, congratulations on the successful launch. Absolutely exciting and really wonderful for us to be able to eventually launch our scientific experiment on the China Space Station. But I can say that cancer knows no boundaries. Cancer affects everyone in every country around the world. There is no cure. We've tried everything on the ground to find a cure for cancer, and we have not succeeded. So it is time for us to look for solutions to cancer for prevention and for treatment in outer space, and we're doing that on the China Space Station. Right. Can you tell us more about, uh, you know, um, your cooperation, uh, rather the cooperation between tuners in space and this Chinese Space Station project? 
Uh, well, I can say that there is a previous group of Chinese scientists uh, who flew a cancer experiment using two-dimensional cells. We're using organoids, so this is the most advanced cancer research experiment ever conducted in outer space with, with tumors in space. But a previous scientific group in China did find that space flight may slow or stop the growth of cancer. And so this evidence um, is crucial to tumors in space um, on the China Space Station. Yeah, Mr. Xu, uh, talking about you know the, the cancer uh, that is a, a real threat, uh, that is a potential threat, um, but that can be an imminent threat for so many and so many families. How important is it for countries, you know, to come together and tackle this challenge? Well, I think uh, biologically, uh, the uh, space station is very useful for uh, testing a number of. Uh, 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 new technologies and demonstrating uh, those technologies for application in, in daily life. Uh, we have uh, previously cardiovascular uh, microgravity flight test. We also have um, uh, testing uh, and experiments on the loss of bones and, and muscles from space. So these are some of the challenges biologically uh, to the ground crew, to the ground people, people living on this earth. Uh, we can use space facility to, uh, to tackle and find solutions uh, to these problems, I mean, even cancer. And also, uh, with the pandemic hitting us with COVID-19, I don't want to exclude the possibility of finding solutions in outer space. So there's always uh, potentials that we can explore and possibilities uh, that we can, we can work on. You know, many, many people are asking, what does this you know, space mission and the experiments uh, you know, there have to do with me and my life? But a lot of these research uh, have something to do with uh, basic research, right? Yes, uh, we, we have to understand better. Uh, we, we, the, the knowledge that we accumulate is uh, from the grants uh, itself. So we have always considered the microgravity or environment as one of the environment that we have to validate and to demonstrate new technologies, such as uh, fluid dynamics, such as combustion in outer space, and even biologically to see the difference between uh, plants and animals and how they behave in outer space. These are all uh, new areas that we want to uh, witness or to de uh, demonstrate and test by ourselves. Uh, we have done the uh, crystal pro uh, protein crystallization year, decades back with uh, the return capsule. And along that, we also had the seeding program, which is to expose the, the agricultural seeds in outer space and to, to bring it back and cultivate and see if there's a better harvest. So everything is connected to outer space, not to mention some of the infrastructures that we're using in daily life, including navigations and telecommunications. Uh, we, we have been taken granted for those facilities, uh, like using our cell phones to, to know the locations and to travel. So without uh, a GPS and navigation system, everything will be blacked, so uh, will be blocked. So we are, uh, we, we, we always have a saying that if you switch off space facility for one day, you would lose everything. You lose the weather forecast, you, you lose the telecommunication, you lose navigation, and basically you're blind people. Yeah, thank you for educating us about the importance of this research, uh, myself included. Um, Dr. LaRose, do you agree? I mean, do you have anything to add? Absolutely. You know, space technology drives our science. Um, because we are the most advanced cancer experiment in outer space, we're using organoids, which are actually biopsies from cancer patients. So it's real 3D human tissue, we need to build our experimental unit from the ground up. We can't purchase it. This research has never been done before. And while we're driving forward with this innovation for our technology, there's an unlimited potential for spin-offs that could work in, in laboratories on the ground, uh, in clinics and hospitals um, all around the world. And so most certainly technology really helps. It really drives our science forward when we're talking about space applications. Absolutely. Right. Uh, Dr. LaRose, you know, so far half of all American astronauts who have landed on the moon have died uh, due to various uh, disease caused by uh, cosmic radiation. Does the space environment have fatal impact on astronauts? That's a tough question. Perhaps we should be asking, does it have a fatal impact on taikonauts uh, rather than astronauts? Um, but certainly cosmic radiation is absolutely deadly. And one of the things we're doing with tumors in space is we're looking to see the unique mutational signature of cosmic radiation. 
we can actually look for a fingerprint in the DNA of our organoids to see whether cosmic radiation leaves this fingerprint. We can then look at different disease states in our tychonauts, for example, to see if that same mutational signature is present. So in this way, we can actually predict the risk of different diseases that is associated with cosmic radiation. Well, another important question, the gender gap. According to UNESCO data, women currently account for less than 30% of scientific researchers in the world. How do you see the gender gap in science and engineering? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. You're, you're speaking to a scientist who has a six-month-old baby girl at home. Um, and I can say it's challenging raising a family. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, she's, uh, she's lovely. Uh, perhaps her first word will be uh, in Chinese. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, <laughs> but um, it's it's challenging. As women, we have uh, different um, gender roles. Uh, we take care of our, our family in a different way in our home, and, and this is around the world. And so it is challenging when we prioritize our family units. But beyond women, there are other people all around the world who also need a voice, who are also marginalized. And I would say that voices in China, regardless of gender, are equally important on the world stage. Um, it's time for, for China, for science and technology in China to reach that world stage, to be recognized and, and to be reputable. And this is why Tumors in Space is absolutely thrilled uh, to be sending our experiment on the China Space Station. Right. Um, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing with us uh, the stories. And um, Mr. Xu, uh, you know, talking about the selection process, the qualifications of astronauts uh, going forward for future missions, uh, of course, this is, you know, uh, a state secret. But uh, I mean, from an expert's point of view, what would be the qualifications for picking uh, future astronauts? Well, I think uh, space travel has become normalized because of uh, uh, there are a number of tourists already been to space, and the uh, International Space Station has been uh, accommodating quite a few visitors. Uh, not only uh, we're choosing uh, astronauts from uh, uh, Air Force, uh, that was a tradition before also by NASA and by Russia and also by China. Uh, but with the progress of scientific uh, innovations, uh, this, the presence of scientists and technicians uh, on board the uh, space station have become uh, more and more uh, imminent and important. So we're choosing a physically fitted person uh, to, to, to be on board the station. This is also not only for the, uh, for the crew themselves, but also for the uh, experiments and science that they're conducting. Uh, uh, for example, like uh, the, the organization that is working on, on, uh, on medications, uh, we can send uh, some kind of doctor uh, who understands uh, better the biological changes on board the station so that he can witness by his own eye the growth or the uh, the seas of the cells uh, on board the mission instead of bringing back the samples or the data back uh, which are which are more cold uh, than the than the uh, livelihood of vivid uh, experiment so scientists on board the mission uh, on board the station is very important in in the future missions if you want to do something uh, fundamental and uh, cutting edge, I think, uh, to, to board a scientist on board, which, uh, on board the station is very important. Right. Uh, talking about these missions, Dr. LaRose, U.S. laws heavily restricts NASA scientists from collaborating directly with China. Uh, you noted that uh, you, know, your, you and your colleagues encountered uh, an unexpected levels of hesitancy toward uh, granting applications related to the Chinese space station. To what extent do you think geopolitics will add uh, you know, difficulties to the level of international cooperation? That's an excellent question. And as far as I understand, China is becoming more and more open to collaborating with, example, uh, with NASA, for example. And in my work at the International Space University in France, I've worked with many Chinese colleagues and NASA colleagues in the same room because it's a neutral uh, forum for space training and education. So I think it's time for us to have a, a shift in our mindset. I mean, here we are with the China Space Station being coordinated by the United Nations, which tells us we can have confidence we are 
accessing space for uh, peaceful uses and for the benefit of all humanity, I think it's time for people, particularly in the West, to shift their perspectives. And this is why as principal investigator for Tumors in Space from Norway, also from Canada, I'm absolutely proud to represent the China Space Station uh, with our experiment. Dr. Tracia LaRose, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dr. LaRose is principal investigator of the Cancer Research Group, Tumors in Space. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, Mr. Xu, you know, talking about um, obstacles, geopolitics and geopolitical tensions is certainly one of them. Um, how bothered or how concerned are you about these you know, man-made barriers, let's say, to international cooperation? Well, I think there are uh, leading countries uh, uh, in the world for space, uh, in the space community. Um, we understand that U.S., uh, Russia, China, uh, are, and European Space Agency are among the leading organizations in space uh, that uh, they play an important role in space. Uh, the international infrastructure, such as ISS, International Space Station, has been participated by a number of countries. And um, well, well, unfortunately, China was not part of that effort. But we are catching up with our own efforts. Uh, I think uh, the uh, geopolitical barriers are very, um, very much an obstacle to cooperation. Uh, but uh, with the uh, with the Europeans, we cooperate very closely, uh, on including the the um, uh, lunar sample uh, return missions and lunar exploration missions and Mars missions. We're cooperating with European Space Agency for te telemetry tracking and control of uh, the spacecraft as well as the uh, instrument that flying on board the Chang'e missions. Uh, and also we cooperate with NASA on single, single project basis. This, of course, has to obtain the Congress approval and Senate approval, of course. Uh, but uh, we did cooperate on the Chang'e 4 mission, on the landing and joint observation using US uh, uh, or lunar orbiter called uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, LRO. So uh, we, we did have some degrees of cooperation, and also we share some of the lunar exploration data. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to exclude, exclude the possibility of cooperating uh, on board the Chinese uh, space station, uh, and also possibly uh, collaboration in the future, as I have uh, knowledge that uh, uh, some commercial cooperation already existed. For example, the NanoRax company have already successfully put the Beijing Institute of Technology's uh, microgravity experiments on board the International Space Station, which was a, a very successful uh, mission. So uh, all possibilities are are open, and I think uh, with the Chinese attitude, we're open for all kinds of international cooperation. That would be really good news for many scientists around the world. We have with us now Professor Bernard Foyn, director of the International Lunar Exploration Working Group's Euro Moon Mars Project. Um, Professor Foeing, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. You know, after the Chinese space station is completed, a space survey telescope will be launched. Uh, the China Sky Survey Telescope, uh, Xun Tian, has similar designs and goals as the European Space Agency's uh, ULICID mission and NASA's uh, mission, uh, which will both launch in coming years. Uh, but will they be working in complementarity with each other? So hello from Europe, and uh, congratulations uh, first to China uh, uh, for the launch of the uh, Tianwei uh, uh, core module, because that will be a great opportunity for international cooperation, but also for science. So we have discussed very interestingly the life science and medical science, but also that's an opportunity for um, space science and astrophysics, and indeed the deployment of uh, uh, the uh, Xiantian uh, uh, telescope survey would be a great achievement. Now there are differences. We have, uh, at the moment in Europe, preparing the so-called Euclid uh, the telescope uh, mission. That's a mission that uh, is uh, targeted to study dark energy and dark matter. And for this, we are going to deploy a telescope, 1.2 meter diameter telescope, that will put in the Lagrangian point, so-called L2, 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth, and where you have a very good uh, background for doing deep astronomy. And this will follow some of the discovery and work that we have done before with our Planck microwave uh, background explorer that has mapped the, the first instant after the Big Bang, the, the big flash after the Big Bang to cosmic microwave background. And from this, we can constrain the property of uh, the universe 
but uh, with uh, Euclid, we will be able to detect even dark matter, so matter that doesn't emit light. And for this, we are using a technique where we look at the deformation of the images of very far galaxies. And from this uh, distorted images, we can reconstruct the map in all dimension of dark matter. So we launched that in 2022, the first, and we will share the data with the world. So we have a team from all over the world of uh, scientists also that will have access to the data. After this, we are expecting the launch of the US Nancy Roman telescope. And uh, this is a telescope that is a bit bigger, 2.4 meters, the same size as the Hubble Space Telescope. It will be also put in L2 uh, uh, point, and it will have a camera uh, that will allow uh, deep observation, 300 times deeper than uh, broader than the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. But in right. addition, it has a special device, so-called coronograph, that in some cases allows to remove the light from a star in order to detect exoplanets. So also some specific application. But now uh, for Suntian, that will be also a great uh, asset because it uh, is also a two meter class telescope. So like the Hubble Space Telescope, it will have a 300 times the field of view of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, it will also co-orbit with uh, Tianwe Space Station. And that's very interesting because, as you know, for the Hubble Space Telescope, we had a number of uh, servicing missions that allow to put new instruments and uh, to, to improve uh, the, the science. And uh, with this uh, ability of co-orbiting, uh, that it's unique, uh, then we'll have also the possibility to put next generation instrument on the um, on the survey telescope. So yeah, Professor really Fong, you know, uh, talking about global cooperation here, Russia recently announced that it will leave the International Space Station uh, project starting in 2025, and it is preparing to build its own space station by 2030. Uh, we know that ISS was once considered to be one of the uh, most, uh, you know, uh, closely cooperated areas between Russia and the United States. Uh, why did Russia end its cooperation with the U.S. for more, uh, you know, after working with it for more than 20 years? So Russia is on board the International Space Station. You are, we have now 11 astronauts, and uh, you have seen them. There are some Russian. So Russia announced uh, that they are planning to build a, a smaller national station, and uh, I think that uh, that could be uh, put in operation. You know, when the ISS is going to its end, but Russia has not yet announced that they are leaving the International Space Station, so they have uh, uh, agreed mm -hmm. uh, at least uh, until end of 2024 to cooperate, and then there will be a transition phase where we'll see, depending on the state of health of the International Space Station and safety, uh, what will be done. Also, uh, from the U.S. side, they are looking at uh, involving some commercial operators to decrease uh, some of the cost of running the space station in order also to start funding other initiatives like a, a smaller commercial station or a, a station around the moon. So we are still working very well with our uh, Russian colleagues and uh, uh, in terms of the science, and we believe as well that the, the space station uh, in the past and in the future will be a great platform for common uh, science, for international cooperation, even at times where uh, the, the politics mm -hmm. are a bit in tension, the, in space we are all together and mm -hmm. we promote uh, right. uh, science cooperation to the benefit of uh, humanity. Of mankind in general. Uh, that, let's hope that's the case. Uh, Mr. Xu, International Space System was established in 1988 and will be retired in 2024. Uh, does that mean China's space station will be one of the very few in orbit? Well, I think uh, uh, with the 2024 uh, imminent uh, retirement timing of the International Space Station, uh, there is also a intention of commercializing uh, all the assets uh, in, on board, as well as uh, some of the nations that want to uh, split and they want to have their own infrastructures. Uh, China has always been indigenous in their own development programs, and we have l started launching the Tianhe. Uh, the first segment launched this morning would be uh, the beginning of the uh, station at last at least 10 years, uh, and maybe even more. Uh, so we are uh, operating this until the year uh, 2031 at least. Uh, so 2024 will be time for the retirement of International Space Station. Uh, commercialization is one big impact 
the same time, also, we see a big commercial booming market in China as well for space. We have 141 companies registered for space, uh, like launch vehicles, propulsion, satellite manufacturings, and all that, uh, by the year uh, 2018 already. Uh, so uh, also, U.S. government have called uh, an con- initiative called Commercial LEO, LEO stands for Low Earth Orbit. So low Earth orbit infrastructure will all be uh, commercialized. Uh, either it's um, uh, government or military or civilian applications. So all of those will be commercialized uh, very soon. So this is also one effort to see the commercialization of International Space Station. But also, we, I, 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 I would I firmly believe that these two infrastructures will coexist exist in, for a period of time and will be mutually supplementary to each other. All right. Uh, Professor Foeing, NASA, announced on January the 27th that they selected Houston-based uh, Axiom Space to build a commercial space station module. The company plans to launch its own first module as soon as 2024. What do you think of NASA, you mean, uh, choosing a commercial space station after retiring from ISS? So actually, NASA announced the launch of astronauts uh, through this commercial company. So that was the real announcement. Uh, NASA has not announced uh, then uh, the build-up of the commercial station. So there are a number of actors uh, that would like to build uh, some commercial uh, station, but uh, at the moment, they don't have the, the full uh, funding. You know, this is a class of funding uh, which is uh, something like 50 times bigger than the launch of an individual astronaut. So uh, uh, now, uh, uh, I think this is coming, and the commercial world is changing very much how we are going to explore uh, Earth's orbit, but also the moon. There are a number of initiatives. Uh, Now, for instance, uh, NASA has uh, selected uh, uh, for uh, the lunar human lander, a commercial company, uh, SpaceX, that has to deliver for a cost of $3 billion uh, human lander. And this goes very well along some of the projects that we have uh, started at ESA in collaboration, not only with NASA, where we collaborated uh, on the human space flight, and we are going to send also some of our uh, astronauts uh, to uh, uh, this uh, lunar station, but we will also accompany uh, uh, NASA in some of the Artemis uh, program where ESA is delivering some service module. But from the robotic side, we have been uh, also working at, uh, in Europe uh, hand in hand with China, and I was very uh, pleased to collaborate at the time where I was leading the Smart One lunar mission of ESA, the first of this millennium. We shared our data with uh, China, with uh, Russia, and, uh, and all the world. And in counterpart, we were invited to collaborate uh, to uh, help uh, the, the Chang'e program. And ESA provided one station and scientific and technical expertise. And uh, since uh, the first launch until the recent uh, uh, Chang'e 5 beautiful sample return, uh, European uh, engineers and scientists have been really uh, uh, supporting uh, the Chang'e program. In parallel, in Europe, we are also collaborating with uh, Russia on some of the robotic program, uh, uh, the Luna mission, uh, Luna 25, that will go uh, toward the pole, and Luna 27, where we will go to the South Polar uh, region to try to extract ice. And so this uh, partnership uh, between uh, uh, Russia and uh, China is also a great uh, significance for international cooperation as uh, we had put on a roadmap you know, to go phase by phase uh, in orbit, to go uh, then in lunar orbit yeah. and then on the lunar yeah. surface. And uh, we are looking forward all these opportunities uh, for us to, us to work together. All right, Professor Bernard Foeing, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And also Director General Xu Yansun, thank you for being with us. Uh, we learned a lot. And thank you for watching Dialogue. I'm Wang Wen in Beijing.